General Idea of the Revolution in the Nineteenth Century Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, 1851 Is there sufficient reason for revolution in the nineteenth century? Chaos of economic forces Tendency of society toward poverty I call certain principles of action economic forces, such as the division of labor, competition, collective force, exchange, credit, property, etc., which are to labor and to wealth what the distinction of classes, the representative system, monarchical heredity, administrative centralization, the judicial hierarchy, etc., are to the state. If these forces are held in equilibrium, subject to the laws which are proper to them, and which do not depend in any way upon the arbitrary will of man, labor can be organized, and comfort for all guaranteed. If, on the other hand, they are left without discretion and without counterpoise, labor is in a condition of chaos, the useful effects of the economic forces are mingled with an equal quantity of injurious effects, the deficit balances the profit. Society, in so far as it is the theater, the agent or the subject of production, circulation, and competition, is in a condition of increasing suffering. Up to now, it does not appear that order in a society can be conceived except under one of these two forms, the political and the industrial, between which, moreover, there is fundamental contradiction. The chaos of industrial forces, the struggle which they maintain with the government system, which is the only obstacle to their organization, and which they cannot reconcile themselves with, nor merge themselves in, is the real profound cause of the unrest which disturbs French society. Everybody has heard of the division of labor. It consists of the distribution of the handwork of a given industry in such a manner that each person performs always the same operation or a small number of operations, so that the product, instead of being the integral product of one workman, is the joint product of a large number. According to Adam Smith, who first demonstrated this law scientifically and all other economists, the division of labor is the most powerful lever of modern industry. To it, principally, must be attributed the superiority of civilized peoples to savage peoples. Without division of labor, the use of machines would not have gone beyond the most ancient and common utensils. The miracles of machinery and of steam would never have been revealed to us. Progress would have been closed to society. The French Revolution itself, lacking an outlet, would have been but a sterile revolt. It could have accomplished nothing. But, on the other hand, by division of labor, the product of labor mounts to tenfold, a hundredfold. Political economy rises to the height of a philosophy. The intellectual level of nations is continually raised. The first thing that should attract the attention of the legislator is the separation of industrial functions, the division of labor. In a society founded upon hatred of the feudal and warlike order, and destined in consequence to organize itself for work and peace, it was not done thus. This economic force was left to all the overturns caused by chance and by interest. The division of labor, becoming always more minute and remaining without counterpoise, the workman has been given over to a more and more degrading subjection to machinery. That is the effect of the division of labor when it is applied as practiced in our days, not only to make industry incomparably more productive, but at the same time to deprive the worker, in mind and body, of all the wealth which it creates for the capitalist and the speculator. All of the economists are in accord as to this fact, one of the most serious which the science has to announce, and if they do not insist upon it with the vehemence which they habitually use in their polemics, it is because they cannot believe that this perversion of the greatest of economic forces can be avoided. So the greater the division of labor and the power of machines, the less the intelligence and skill of hand of the worker. But the more the value of the worker falls and the demand for labor diminishes, the lower are wages and the greater is poverty. And it is not a few hundreds of men but millions who are the victims of this economic perturbation. Philanthropic conservatives, admirers of ancient customs, charge the industrial system with this anomaly. They want to go back to the feudal farming period. I say that it is not industry that is at fault, but economic chaos. I maintain that the principle has been distorted, that there is disorganization of forces, and that to this we must attribute the fatal tendency with which society is carried away. Another example. 
Competition, next to the division of labor, is one of the most powerful factors of industry, and at the same time one of the most valuable guarantees. Partly for the sake of it, the first revolution was brought about. The workmen's unions established at Paris some years ago have recently given it a new sanction by establishing among themselves piecework and abandoning, after their experience of it, the absurd idea of the equality of wages. Competition is, moreover, the law of the market, the spice of the trade, the salt of labor. To suppress competition is to suppress liberty itself. It is to begin the restoration of the old order from below, in replacing labor by the rule of favoritism and abuse, of which 89 rid us. Yet competition, lacking legal forms and superior regulating intelligence, has been perceived in turn like the division of labor. In it, as in the latter, there is perversion of principle, chaos, and a tendency toward evil. This will appear beyond doubt if we remember that of the 36 million souls who compose the French nation, at least 10 millions are wage workers to whom competition is forbidden, for whom there is nothing but to struggle amongst themselves for their meager stipend. Thus that competition, which as thought in 89 should be a general right, is today a matter of exceptional privilege. Only they whose capital permits them to become heads of business concerns may exercise their competitive rights. The result is that competition, instead of democratizing industry, aiding the workmen, guaranteeing the honesty of trade, has ended in building up a mercantile and land aristocracy a thousand times more rapacious than the old aristocracy of the nobility. Through competition, all the profits of production go to capital. The consumer, without suspecting the frauds of commerce, is fleeced by the speculator, and the condition of the workers is made more and more precarious. Competition ought to make us more and more equal and free, and instead it subordinates us one to the other, and makes the worker more and more a slave. This is a perversion of the principle, a forgetfulness of the law. These are not mere accidents, they are a whole system of misfortunes. Let us cite one more example. Of all economic forces, the most vital in a society reconstructed for industry by revolution is credit. The proprietary, industrial, trading business world knows this well. All its efforts since 89 have tended, at the bottom, toward only these two things, peace and credit. In a nation devoted to labor, credit is what blood is to an animal, the means of nutrition, life itself. It cannot be interrupted without danger to the social body. If there is a single institution which should have appealed before all others to our legislators after the abolition of feudal privileges and the leveling of classes, assuredly it is credit. Yet not one of our pompous declarations of right, not one of our constitutions so long and drawn out, not one of these has mentioned it at all. Credit, like the division of labor, the use of machinery and competition, has been left to itself. Even the financial power, far greater than that of the executive, legislative, and judicial, has never had the honor of mention in our various charters. After the revolution as before it, credit got along as best it could, or rather, as it pleased the largest holders of coin. What has been the result of this incredible negligence? In the first place, forestalling and usury being practiced upon coin by preference, coin being at the same time the tool of industrial transactions and the rarest of merchandise, and consequently the safest and most profitable, dealing in money was rapidly concentrated in the hands of a few monopolists whose fortress is the bank. Thereupon the country and the state were made the vassals of a coalition of capitalists. Thanks to the tax imposed by this bankocracy upon all industrial and agricultural industry, property has already been mortgaged for $2 billion and the state for more than $1 billion. Property, fleeced by the bank, has been obliged to follow the same course in its relations with industry, to become a usurer in turn toward labor. Thus, farm rent and house rent have reached a prohibitive rate, which drives the cultivator from the field and the workman from his home. So much so that today they whose labor has created everything cannot buy their own products, nor obtain furniture, nor own a habitation, nor ever say, this house, this garden, this vine, this field, are mine. On the contrary, 
It is an economic necessity in the present system of credit and with the growing disorganization of industrial forces that the poor man, working harder and harder, should always be poorer, and that the rich man, without working, always richer. Some utopians attack competition. Others refuse to accept the division of labor and the whole industrial order. The working men, in their crass ignorance, blame machinery. No one to this day has thought of denying the utility and legitimacy of credit. Nevertheless, it is incontestable that the perversion of credit is the most active cause of the poverty of the masses. Were it not for this, the deplorable effects of the division of labor, of the employment of machinery, of competition, would scarcely be felt at all, would not even exist. Is it not evident that the tendency of society is towards poverty, not through the depravity of men, but through the disorder of its own elementary principles? Anomaly of Government Tendency Toward Tyranny and Corruption What is the principle which rules existing society, each by himself, each for himself, God and luck for all? Privilege, resulting from luck, from a commercial turn, from any of the gambling methods which the chaotic condition of industry furnishes, is then a providential thing which everybody must respect. On the other hand, what is the function of government? To protect and defend each one in his person, his industry, his property. But if by the necessity of things, property, riches, comfort, all go on one side, poverty on the other, it is clear that government is made for the defense of the rich against the poor. For the perfecting of this state of affairs, it is necessary that what exists should be defined and consecrated by law. That is precisely what power wants. What does the system demand? That the capitalistic feudalism shall be maintained in the enjoyment of its rights, that the preponderance of capital over labor shall be increased, that the parasite class shall be reinforced, if possible, by providing for it everywhere hangers-on, through the aid of public functions, and as recruits if necessary, and that large properties shall be gradually re-established and the proprietors ennobled. Finally, that everything shall be attached to the supreme patronage of the state, charities, recompenses, pensions, awards, concessions, exploitations, authorizations, positions, titles, privileges, ministerial offices, stock companies, municipal administrations, etc., etc. Through these three ministries, that of agriculture and commerce, that of public works, and that of the interior, through the taxes of consumption and through the custom house, the government keeps its hand on all that comes and goes, all that is produced and consumed, on all the business of individuals, towns, and provinces. It maintains the tendency of society toward the impoverishment of the masses, the subordinating of the laborers, and the always growing preponderance of parasite offices. Through the police, it watches the enemies of the system. Through the courts, it condemns and represses them. Through the army, it crushes them. Through public institutions, it distributes in such proportions as suit it knowledge and ignorance. Through the church, it puts to sleep any protest in the hearts of men. Through the finances, it defrays the cost of this vast conspiracy at the expense of the workers. Liberty, equality, progress, with all their oratorical consequences, are written in the text of the constitutions and the laws. There is no vestige of them in the institutions. The abuses have changed the face which they bore before 89 to assume a different form of organization. They have diminished neither in number nor gravity. On account of our being engrossed with politics, we have lost sight of social economy. All minds being beswitched with politics, society turns in a circle of mistakes, driving capital to a still more crushing agglomeration, the state to an extension of its prerogatives that is more and more tyrannical, the laboring class to an irreparable decline, physically, morally, and intellectually. In place of this governmental, feudal, and military rule, imitated from that of the former kings, the new edifice of industrial institutions must be built. In place of this materialist centralization which absorbs all the political power, we must create the intellectual and liberal centralization of economic forces. Social Liquidation To deduce the organizing principle of the revolution, the idea, at once economic and legal, of reciprocity and of contract, 
taking account of the difficulties and opposition which this deduction must encounter, whether on the part of revolutionary sects, parties, or societies, or from the reactionaries and defenders of the status quo, to expound the totality of these reforms and new institutions wherein labor finds its guarantee, property its limit, commerce its balance, and government its farewell, that is to tell, from the intellectual point of view, the story of the revolution. Two producers have the right to promise each other and to guarantee reciprocally for the sale or exchange of their respective products, agreeing upon the articles and the prices. The same promise of reciprocal sale or exchange, under the same legal conditions, may exist among an unlimited number of producers. It will be the same contract, repeated an unlimited number of times. French citizens have the right to agree, and if desired, to club together for the establishment of bakeries, butcher shops, grocery stores, etc., which will guarantee them the sale and exchange, at a reduced price and of good quality, of bread, meat, and all articles of consumption which the present mercantile chaos gives them of light weight, adulterated, and at an exorbitant price. For this purpose, the housekeeper was founded a society for the mutual insurance of a just price and honest exchange of products. By the same rule, citizens have the right to found, for their common advantage, a bank, with such capital as they choose, for the purpose of obtaining at a low price the currency that is indispensable in their transactions, and to compete with individual privileged banks. In agreeing among themselves with this object, they will only be making use of the right which is guaranteed to them by the principle of the freedom of commerce. Thus, a bank of discount may be a public establishment, and to found it there is needed neither association, nor fraternity, nor obligation, nor state intervention. Only a reciprocal promise for sale or exchange is needed, in a word, a simple contract. This settled... I say that not only may a bank of discount be a public establishment, but that such a bank is needed. Here is the proof. The Bank of France was founded, with governmental privilege, by a company of stockholders with a capital of $18 million. The specie at present buried in its vaults amounts to about $120 million. Thus, five-sixths of this specie, which has accumulated in the vaults of the bank by the substitution of paper for metal in general circulation, is the property of the citizens. Therefore, the bank, by nature of its mechanism, which consists in using capital which does not belong to it, ought to be a public institution. Another cause of this accumulation of specie is the gratuitous privilege, which the Bank of France has obtained from the state, of issuing notes against the specie of which it is the depository. So, as every privilege is public property, the Bank of France, by its privilege alone, tends to become a public institution. The privilege of issuing banknotes and of gradually displacing coin by paper in the circulation has for its immediate result on one hand to give the stockholders of the bank an amount of interest far in excess of that due to their capital, on the other to maintain the price of money at a high rate to the great profit of the class of bankers and money lenders, but to the great detriment of producers, manufacturers, merchants, consumers of every kind who make use of currency. This excess of interest paid to the stockholders and the rise in the rates for money, both the result of the desire which power has always had to make itself agreeable to the rich capitalistic class, are unjust. They cannot last forever, therefore the bank, by the illegitimacy of its privileges, is doomed to become a public establishment. The present rate of interest on money at the bank is 4%, which means 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9% at other bankers, who almost alone have the privilege of discounting at the bank. Well, as this interest belongs to the public, the public will be able to reduce it at will to 3, 2, 1, one half and one fourth percent, according to whether it is found to be of greater advantage to draw a large revenue from the bank or to carry on business at a lower cost. Let this course of reduction, for however small an amount, once be entered upon, then, I assert, the social tendency in all that concerns the price of money and discount throughout the whole territory of the Republic will be immediately changed, ipso facto and that this simple change will cause the country to pass from the present capitalistic and governmental system to a revolutionary system. Ah, is anything so terrible as a revolution? If I desire to pay no interest to the bank, 
It is because interest is in my eyes a governmental, feudal practice, from which we shall never be able to escape if the bank of the country becomes a bank of the state. For a long time, socialism has dreamed of a state bank, state credit, revenues and profits of the state, all which means the democratic and social consecration of the exploitation principle, robbery of the worker, in the name with the example and under the patronage of the republic. Place the bank of the people in the hands of the government, and under the pretext of saving for the state the profits of discount in place of new taxes, new sinecures, huge picklings, unheard of waste will be created at the expense of the people. Usury, parasitism, and privilege will again be favored. No, no, I want no state, not even for a servant. I reject government, even direct government. I see in all these inventions only pretexts for parasitism and refuges for idlers. Let us take up this great question of property, the source of such intolerable pretensions and of such ridiculous fears. The revolution has two things to accomplish about property, its dissolution and its reconstruction. I shall address myself first to its dissolution and begin with buildings. If by the above described measures property and buildings were relieved of mortgages, if the owners and builders found capital at a low price, the former for the buildings they wanted to put up, the latter for the purchase of materials, it would follow in the first place that the cost of construction would diminish considerably, and that old buildings could be cheaply and advantageously repaired, and furthermore that a drop in the rental of buildings would be perceived. On the other hand, as capital could no longer be invested with advantage in government securities and in banks, capitalists would be led to seek investments in real estate, especially in buildings which are always more productive than land. There would thereupon occur in this matter also an increase of competition. The supply of buildings would tend to outrun the demand, and the rentals would fall still lower. It would fall so much the more, as the reduction of interest collected by the bank and paid to the creditors of the state was greater, and if, as I propose, the interest of money were fixed at zero, the returns of capital invested in buildings would soon be zero also. Then, as the rental of buildings is composed of but three factors, the reimbursement of the capital spent in their construction, the keeping up of the building, and the taxes, a lease would cease to be a loan for use, and would become a sale by the builder to the tenant. Finally, as speculation would no longer seek buildings as an investment, but only as an object of industry, the purely legal relation of landlord and tenant, which the Roman law has transmitted to us, would give place to a purely commercial relation between the seller and the tenant. There would be the same relation, and in consequence the same law, the same jurisdiction, as between the forwarder of a package and the consignee. In a word, house rent, losing its feudal character, would become an act of commerce. The right of property, so honorable in its origin when that origin is none other than labor, has become in Paris and in most cities an improper and immoral instrument of speculation in the dwelling places of citizens. Speculation in bread and food of prime necessity is punished as a misdemeanor, sometimes as a crime. Is it more permissible to speculate in the habitations of the people? Through the land the plundering of man began, and in the land it has rooted its foundations. The land is the fortress of the modern capitalist, as it was the citadel of feudalism and of the ancient patriciate. Finally, it is the land which gives authority to the governmental principle, an ever-renewed strength whenever the popular Hercules overthrows the giant. Today the stronghold, attacked upon all the secret points of its bastions, is about to fall before us, as fell at the sound of Joshua's trumpets the walls of Jericho. The machine which is able to overthrow the ramparts has been found. It is not my invention, it has been invented by property itself. Suppose that the proprietors, no longer waiting for the government to act but taking their affairs into their own hands, follow the example of the workmen's associations and get together to found a bank by subscription or mutual guarantee. Nothing is easier than to apply to the repurchase of land the mechanism of this system of credit, which is usually regarded only as a protection against excessive interest and an instrument for the conversion of mortgages. With the land bank, the farmer is released. It is the proprietor who is caught. Thus, what we call farm rent, left to us by Roman tyranny and federal usurpation, hangs only by a thread, the organization of a bank demanded even by property itself. 
it has been demonstrated that the land tends to return to the hands that cultivate it, and that farm rent, like house rent, like the interest of mortgages, is but an improper speculation, which shows the disorder and anomaly of the present economic system. Whatever may be the conditions of this bank, whatever be the rate of charge for its services, however small its issues, it can be calculated in how many years the soil will be delivered from the parasitism which sucks it dry while strangling the cultivator. And when once the revolutionary machine shall have released the soil and agriculture shall have become free, feudal exploitation can never re-establish itself. Property may then be sold, bought, circulated, divided, or united. Anything. The ball and chain of the old serfdom will never be dragged again. Property will have lost its fundamental vices. It will be transfigured. It will no longer be the same thing. Still, let us continue to call it by its ancient name, so dear to the heart of man, so agreeable to the ear of the peasant, property. Organization of Economic Forces When I agree with one or more of my fellow citizens for any object whatever, it is clear that my own will is my law. It is I myself who, in fulfilling my obligation, am my own government. Therefore, if I could make a contract with all as I can with some, if all could renew it among themselves, if each group of citizens as a town, county, province, corporation, company, etc., formed by a like contract, and considered as a moral person, could thereafter, and always by a similar contract, agree with every and all other groups, it would be the same as if my own will were multiplied to infinity. I should be sure that the law thus made on all questions in the Republic from millions of different initiatives would never be anything but my law, and if this new order of things were called government, it would be my government. Thus the principle of contract, far more than that of authority, would bring about the union of producers, centralize their forces, and assure the unity and solidarity of their interests. The system of contracts, substituted for the system of laws, would constitute the true government of the man and of the citizen, the true sovereignty of the people, the republic. For the contract is liberty, the first term of the republican motto. We have demonstrated this superabundantly in our studies on the principle of authority and on social liquidation. I am not free when I depend upon another for my work, my wages, or the measure of my rights and duties, whether that other be called the majority or society. No more am I free, either in my sovereignty or in my action, when I am compelled by another to revise my law, were that other the most skillful and most just of arbiters. I am no more at all free when I am forced to give myself a representative to govern me, even if he were my most devoted servant. The contract is equality, in its profound and spiritual essence. Does this man believe himself my equal? Does he not take the attitude of my master and exploiter, who demands from me more than it suits me to furnish and has no intention of returning it to me? Who says that I am incapable of making my own law and expects me to submit to his? The contract is fraternity, because it identifies all interests, unifies all divergences, resolves all contradictions, and in consequence gives wings to the feelings of goodwill and kindness, which are crushed by economic chaos, the government of representatives, alien law. The contract, finally, is order, since it is the organization of economic forces instead of the alienation of liberties, the sacrifice of rights, the subordination of wills. Let us give an idea of this organism after liquidation, reconstruction, after the thesis and antithesis, the synthesis. Credit. The organization of credit is three-quarters done by the winding up of the privileged and usurious banks, and their conversion into a national bank of circulation and loan at one-half, one-fourth, or one-eighth percent. It remains only to establish branches of the bank wherever necessary, and to gradually retire a specie from circulation, depriving gold and silver of their privilege as money. As for personal credit, it is not for the national bank to have to do with it. It is with the working men's unions and the farming and industrial societies that personal credit should be exercised. I have shown above how property, repurchased by the house rent or ground rent, would come back to the tenant farmer and house tenant. It remains for me to show, especially in relation to property in land, the organizing power of the principle which we have invoked to bring about this conversation. I have been obliged to conclude that the hypothesis of state ownership and general farm tenancy did not contain the solution that I sought, and that, after having settled for the land, it would be necessary to seriously consider reassigning it in full sovereignty to the worker, 
because without that, neither his pride as a citizen nor his rights as a producer could be satisfied. Make of this idea, apparently quite negative, and which at first seemed a mere fancy for the need of the cause, make of it a positive, general, fixed rule, and property becomes constituted. It will receive its organization, its rules, its police, its sanction. It will have fulfilled the idea beneath it, its charter for all and accepted by all in a single clause, whence all the rest is deducible by the light of common sense. With this simple contract, protected, consolidated, and guaranteed by the Commercial and Agricultural Association, you may, without the slightest apprehension, permit the proprietor to sell, transmit, alienate, circulate his property at will. Property in land, under this new system, property deprived of rent, delivered from its chains and cured of its leprosy, is in the hands of the proprietor like a five-franc piece or a banknote in the hands of the bearer. It is worth so much, neither more nor less. It can neither gain nor lose in value by changing hands. It is no longer subject to depreciation. Above all, it has lost that fatal power of accumulation which it had, not in itself, but through the ancient prejudice in favor of caste and nobility which attached to it. Thus, from the point of view of equality of conditions, of the guarantee of labor and of public security, property in land cannot cause the slightest perturbation to social economy. It has lost its vicious character. There remain to be seen the good qualities which it must have acquired. It is to this that I call the attention of my readers, notably of the communist, whom I beg to weigh well the differences between association, that is to say, government and contract. Division of Labor Collective Forces, Machines, Working Men's Associations Agricultural labor, resting on this basis, appears in its natural dignity. Of all occupations, it is the most noble, the most healthful from the point of view of morals and health, and as intellectual exercise, the most encyclopedic. From all these considerations, agricultural labor is the one which least requires the societary form. We may say even more strongly, which most energetically rejects it. Never have peasants been seen to form a society for the cultivation of their fields. Never will they be seen to do so. The only relations of unity and solidarity which can exist among farm workers, the only centralization of which rural industry is susceptible, is that which we have pointed out which results from compensation for economic rent, mutual insurance, and most of all from abolishing rent, which makes accumulation of land, parceling out of the soil, serfdom of the peasant, dissipation of inheritances, forever impossible. It is otherwise with certain industries which require the combined employment of a large number of workers, a vast array of machines and hands, and, to make use of a technical expression, a greater division of labor, and in consequence a high concentration of power. In such cases, workman is necessarily subordinate to workman, man dependent on man. The producer is no longer, as in the fields, a sovereign and free father of a family. It is a collectivity. Railroads, mines, and factories are examples. In such cases, it is one of two things. Either the workman, necessarily a peace worker, will be simply the employee of the proprietor capitalist promoter, or he will participate in the chances of loss or gain of the establishment. He will have a voice in the council. In a word, he will become an associate. In the first case, the workman is subordinated, exploited. His permanent condition is one of obedience and poverty. In the second case, he resumes his dignity as a man and citizen. He may aspire to comfort. He forms a part of the producing organization of which he was before but the slave. As in the town, he forms a part of the sovereign power of which he was before but the subject. Thus we need not hesitate, for we have no choice. In cases in which production requires great division of labor and a considerable collective force, it is necessary to form an association among the workers in this industry— because without that, they would remain related as subordinates and superiors, and there would ensue two industrial castes of masters and wage workers, which is repugnant to a free and democratic society. Such, therefore, is the rule that we must lay down if we wish to conduct the revolution intelligently. Every industry, operation, or enterprise which by its nature requires the employment of a large number of workmen of different specialties is destined to become a society or a company of workers. But where the product can be obtained by the action of an individual or a family, without the cooperation of special abilities, there is no opportunity for association. 
association not being called for by the nature of the work, cannot be profitable nor of long continuance. I do not consider as falling within the logical class of division of labor, nor of collective force, the innumerable small shops which are found in all trades, and which seem to me the effect of the preference of the individuals who conduct them, rather than the organic result of a combination of forces. Anybody who is capable of cutting out and sewing up a pair of shoes can get a license, open a shop, and hang out a sign, so-and-so, manufacturing shoe merchant, although there may be only himself behind his counter. If a companion who prefers journeyman's wages to running the risk of starting in business joins with the first, one will call himself the employer, the other the hired man. In fact, they are completely equal and completely free. But when the enterprise requires the combined aid of several industries, professions, special trades, when from this combination springs a new product that could not be made by any individual, a combination in which man fits in with man as wheel with wheel, the whole group of workers forms a machine, like the fitting of the parts of a clock or a locomotive, then, indeed, the conditions are no longer the same. Who could arrogate the right to exploit such a body of slaves? Who would be daring enough to take one man for a hammer, another for a spade, this one for a hook, that one for a lever? The industry to be carried on, the work to be accomplished, are the common and undivided property of all those who take part therein. The granting of franchises for mines and railroads to companies of stockholders who plunder the bodies and souls of the wage workers is a betrayal of power, a violation of the rights of the public, an outrage upon human dignity and personality. The cultivator had been bent under feudal servitude through rent and mortgages. He is freed by the land bank, and above all, by the right of the user to the property. The land, vast in extent and in depth, becomes the basis of equality. In the same way, the wage worker of the great industries had been crushed into a condition worse than that of the slave by the loss of the advantage of collective force. But by the recognition of his right to the profit from this force of which he is the producer, he resumes his dignity, he regains comfort, the great industries, terrible engines of aristocracy and pauperism, become in their turn one of the principal organs of liberty and public prosperity. By participation in losses and gains, by the graded scale of pay and the successive promotion to all grades and positions, the collective force, which is a product of the community, ceases to be a source of profit to a small number of managers and speculators. It becomes the property of all the workers. At the same time, by a broad education, by the obligation of apprenticeship, and by the cooperation of all who take part in the collective work, the division of labor can no longer be a cause of degradation for the workman. It is, on the contrary, the means of his education and the pledge of his security. Constitution of Value Organization of Low Prices If commerce or exchange carried on after a fashion is already by its inherent merit a producer of wealth, if for this reason it has been practiced always and by all nations of the globe, if in consequence we must consider it as an economic force, it is not the less true, and it springs from the very notion of exchange, that commerce ought to be so much the more profitable if sales and purchases are made at the lowest and most just price, that is to say, if the products that are exchanged can be furnished in greater abundance and in more exact proportion. Certain economists have nevertheless aspired to erect into a law this mercantile disorder and commercial disturbance. They see in it a principle as sacred as that of the family or of labor. The school of Say, sold out to English and native capitalism, has for ten years past seemed to exist only to protect and applaud the execrable work of the monopolists of money and necessaries, deepening more and more the obscurity of a science naturally difficult and full of complications. Everybody knows that from the earliest period, exchange has been separated into two elementary operations— sale and purchase. Money is the universal commodity, the tally which serves to connect the two operations and to complete the exchange. According to what we have just said, sale will be genuine, normal, fair from the point of view of economic justice and of value if it is made at a just price as far as human calculation permits this to be established. But unfortunately for humanity, things are not done so in commerce. The price of things is not proportionate to their value. It is larger or smaller according to an influence which justice condemns, but the existing economic chaos excuses. Usury. 
usury is the arbitrary factor in commerce, inasmuch as under the present system, the producer has no guarantee that he can exchange his product, nor the merchant any certainty of reselling. Each one endeavors to pass off his merchandise at the highest possible price, in order to obtain by the excess of profit the security of which labor and exchange fail sufficiently to assure him. The profit thus obtained in excess of the cost, including the wages of the seller, is called increase. Increase, theft, is therefore compensation for insecurity. Everybody being given to increase, there is reciprocal falsehood in all relations and universal deceit by common consent as to the value of things. This is what the revolution proposes. Since there is a universal tacit agreement among all producers and traders to take from each other increase for their products or services, to work in the dark in their dealings, to play a sharp game, in a word, to take each other by surprise by all the tricks of the trade, why should there not as well be a universal and tacit agreement to renounce increase, that is to say, to sell and pay at the only just price, which is the average cost? What will surprise more than one reader, and what seems at first sight contradictory, is that a just price, like any sort of service or guarantee, must be paid for. The low price of merchandise, like the merchandise itself, must have its recompense. Without this premium offered to the merchant, the just price becomes impossible, the low price a chimera. If the dealer usually refuses to sell his goods at cost, it is on the one hand because he has no certainty of selling enough to secure him an income on the other, because he has no guarantee that he will obtain like treatment for his purchases. Without this double guarantee, sale at a just price, the same as sale below the market price, is impossible. The only cases in which it occurs arise from failures and liquidations. Do you wish, then, to obtain goods at a just price, to gain the advantage of a low price, to practice a truth-telling commerce, to assure equality in exchange? You must offer the merchant a sufficient guarantee. This guarantee may take various forms. Perhaps the consumers who wish to have the benefit of a just price are producers themselves and will obligate themselves in turn to sell their products to the dealer on like terms as is done among the different Parisian associations. Perhaps the consumers will content themselves without any reciprocal arrangements with assuring the retailer of a premium, the interest, for example, of his capital or a fixed bonus, or a sale large enough to assure him of a revenue. This is what is generally done by the butchers' associations and by the housekeeper society of which we have already spoken. When, by the liquidation of debts, the organization of credit, the deprivation of the power of increase of money, the limitation of property, the establishment of workingmen's associations, and the use of a just price, the tendency to raising of prices shall have been definitely replaced by a tendency to lower them and the fluctuations of the market by a normal commercial rate, when general consent shall have brought this great about-face of the sphere of trade, then value, at once the most ideal and the most real of things, may be said to have been constituted, and will express at any moment, for every kind of product, the true relation of labor and wealth, while preserving its mobility through the eternal progress of industry. The constitution of value solves the problem of competition and that of the rights of invention, the organization of workmen's associations solves that of collective force and of the division of labor. I can merely indicate at this moment these consequences of the main theorem. Their development would take too much space in a philosophical review of the revolution. Foreign Commerce Balance of Imports and Exports By the suppression of custom houses, the revolution, according to theory and regardless of all military and diplomatic influences, will spread from France abroad, extend over Europe, and afterwards over the world. To suppress our custom houses is in truth to organize foreign trade as we have organized domestic trade. In the matter of the tariff, as in everything else, the status quo, indicated by rising prices, is reaction. Progress, indicated by falling prices, is the revolution. As for me, I who oppose the free traders because they favor interest while they demand the abolition of tariffs, I should favor lowering the tariff from the moment that interest fell, and if interest were done away with, or even lowered to one-fourth or one-half percent, I should be in favor of free trade. Free trade would then become equal exchange. The diversity of interests among nations would gradually result in unity of interest, and the day would dawn when war would cease among nations, as would lawsuits among individuals, from lack of litigable material and absence of cause for conflict. 
absorption of government by the economic organism, given the man, the family, society, an individual sexual and social being endowed with reason, love, and conscience, capable of learning by experience, of perfecting himself by reflection, and of earning his living by work. The problem is to so organize the powers of this being that he may remain always at peace with himself, and may extract from nature which is given to him the largest possible amount of well-being. We know how previous generations have solved it. This system may be called the system of order by authority. It is desirable in order to convince the mind to set alongside each other the fundamental ideas of, on one hand, the politico-religious system, on the other hand, the economic system. Government, then, that is to say church and state, indivisibly united, has for its dogmas 1. The original perversity of human nature. 2. The inevitable inequality of fortunes. 3. The permanency of quarrels and wars. 4. The irremediability of poverty. Whence it is deduced, the necessity of government, of obedience, of resignation, and of faith. These principles admitted, as they still are, almost universally, the forms of authority are already settled. They are a. The division of the people into classes or castes, subordinate to one another, graduated to form a pyramid, at the top of which appears, like the divinity upon his altar, like the king upon his throne, authority. b. Administrative centralization. c. Judicial hierarchy. d. Police. e. Worship. What is the aim of this organization? To maintain order in society by consecrating and sanctifying obedience of the citizen to the state, subordination of the poor to the rich, of the common people to the upper class, of the worker to the idler, of the layman to the priest, of the businessman to the soldier. Beneath the governmental machinery, in the shadow of political institutions, out of the sight of statesmen and priests, Society is producing its own organism, slowly and silently, and constructing a new order, the expression of its vitality and autonomy, and the denial of the old politics, as well as of the old religion. This organization, which is as essential to society as it is incompatible with the present system, has the following principles. 1. The indefinite predictability of the individual and of the race. 2. The honorableness of work. 3 the equality of fortunes. 4. The identity of interests. 5. The end of antagonisms. 6. The universality of comfort. 7. The sovereignty of reason. 8. The absolute liberty of the man and of the citizen. I mentioned below its principal forms of activity. a. Division of labor, through which classification of the people by industries replaces classification by caste. b. Collective power, the principle of workmen's associations in place of armies. C. Commerce, the concrete form of contract which takes the place of law. D. Equality in exchange. E. Competition. F. Credit, which turns upon interests as the governmental hierarchy turns upon obedience. G. The equilibrium of values and of properties. The old system, standing on authority and faith, was essentially based on divine right. The principle of the sovereignty of the people, introduced later, did not change its nature. The sovereignty of the people has been, if I may say so, for a century past, but a skirmishing line for liberty. The new system, based upon the spontaneous practice of industry, in accordance with individual and social reason, is the system of human right. Opposed to arbitrary command, essentially objective, it permits neither parties nor sects, it is complete in itself and allows neither restriction nor separation. There is no fusion possible between the political and economic systems, between the system of law and the system of contracts. One or the other must be chosen. But to live without government, to abolish all authority, absolutely and unreservedly, to set up pure anarchy, seems to them ridiculous and inconceivable, a plot against the republic and against the nation. What will these people who talk of abolishing government put in place of it, they ask? We have no trouble in answering. It is industrial organization that we will put in place of government, as we have just shown. In place of laws, we will put contracts. No more laws voted by a majority, nor even unanimously. Each citizen, each town, each industrial union makes its own laws. 
In place of political powers, we will put economic forces. In place of the ancient classes of nobles, burghers, and peasants, or of businessmen and working men, we will put the general titles and special departments of industry, agriculture, manufacture, commerce, etc. In place of public force, we will put collective force. In place of standing armies, we will put industrial associations. In place of police, we will put identity of interests. In place of political centralization, we will put economic centralization. Do you see now how there can be order without functionaries, a profound and holy intellectual unity? You who cannot conceive of unity without a whole apparatus of legislators, prosecutors, attorneys general, custom house officers, policemen, you have never known what real unity is. What you call unity and centralization is nothing but perpetual chaos serving as a basis for endless tyranny. It is the advancing of the chaotic condition of social forces as an argument for despotism, a despotism which is really the cause of the chaos. We have shown that the industrial system is the harmony of interests resulting from social liquidation, free currency and credit, the organization of economic forces, and the constitution of value and property. When that is accomplished, what use will there be any more for government? What use punishment? What use judicial power? The contract solves all problems. The producer deals with the consumer, the member with his society, the farmer with his township, the township with the province, the province with the state. The secret of this equalizing of the citizen and the state, as well as of the believer and the priest, the plaintiff and the judge, lies in the economic equation which we have herein before made, by the abolition of capitalist interest between the worker and the employer, the farmer and the proprietor. Do away with this last remnant of the ancient slavery by the reciprocity of obligations, and both citizens and communities will have no need of the intervention of the state to carry on their business, take care of their property, build their ports, bridges, quays, canals, roads, establish markets, transact their litigation, instruct, direct, control, censor their agents, perform any acts of supervision or police, any more than they will need its aid in offering their adoration to the Most High, or in judging their criminals and putting it out of their power to do injury, supposing that the removal of motive does not bring the cessation of crime. The revolution would be in vain if it were not contagious. It would perish even in France if it failed to become universal. Everybody is convinced of that. The least enthusiastic spirits do not believe it necessary for revolutionary France to interfere among other nations by force of arms. It will be enough for her to support, by her example and her encouragement, any effort of the people of foreign nations to follow her example. What, then, is the revolution completed abroad as well as at home? Capitalistic and proprietary exploitation stopped everywhere, the wage system abolished, equal and just exchange guaranteed, value constituted, cheapness assured, the principle of protection changed, and the markets of the world opened to the producers of all nations. Consequently, the barrier struck down, the ancient law of nations replaced by commercial agreements. Police, judiciary, administration everywhere committed to the hands of workers. The economic organization replacing the governmental and military system in the colonies as well as in the great cities. Finally, the free and universal commingling of races under the law of contract only. That is the revolution. Understood once for all, the most characteristic, the most decisive result of the revolution is, after having organized labor and property, to do away with political centralization, in a word, with the state. The kings may sharpen their swords for their last campaign. The revolution in the 19th century has for its supreme task not so much the overthrow of their dynasties as the destruction to the last root of their institution. Born as they are to war, educated for war, supported by war, domestic and foreign, of what use can they be in a society of labor and peace? Henceforth, there can be no more purpose in war than in refusal to disarm. Universal brotherhood being established upon a sure foundation, there is nothing for the representatives of despotism to do but to take their leave. As for those who, after the departure of kings, still dream of consulates, of presidencies, of dictatorships, of marshalships, of admiralties, and of ambassadorships, they also will do well to retire. The revolution, having no need for their services, can dispense with their talents. 
The people no longer want this coin of monarchy. They understand that whatever phraseology is used, feudal system, governmental system, military system, parliamentary system, system of police, laws, and tribunals, and system of exploitation, corruption, lying, and poverty, are all synonymous. Finally, they know that in doing away with rent and interest, the last remnants of the old slavery, the revolution at one blow does away with the sword of the executioner, the blade of justice, the club of the policeman, the gauge of the customs officer, the erasing knife of the bureaucrat, all those insignia of government which young liberty grinds beneath her heel. Epilogue The fundamental decisive idea of this revolution. Is it not this? No more authority neither in the church, nor in the state, nor in land, nor in money. No more authority. That means something we have never seen, something we have never understood. The harmony of the interest of one with the interest of all, the identity of collective sovereignty and individual sovereignty. No more authority. That means debts paid, servitude abolished, mortgages lifted, rents reimbursed, the expense of worship, justice, and the state suppressed free credit, equal exchange, free association, regulated value, education, work, property, domicile, low price guaranteed, no more antagonism, no more war, no more centralization, no more governments, no more priests. Is not that society emerged from its shell and walking upright? No more authority. That is to say further, free contract in place of arbitrary law, voluntary transactions in place of the control of the state, equitable and reciprocal justice in place of sovereign and distributive justice, rational instead of revealed morals, equilibrium of forces instead of equilibrium of powers, economic unity in place of political centralization. Once more, I ask, is not this what I may venture to call a complete reversal, a turnover, a revolution?